I'm going to talk about technology, and I'm least qualified to talk about it. Although I'm a mechanical engineer, <laughs> no, I'm not really qualified to talk about technology. But I certainly have a fairly decent experience set in the area of market research. So talking about technology and its interface with market research is something that I feel somewhat qualified to talk about. So that's what I'm going to be doing today. My conviction and belief is right there on the first stage. Either we embrace it or we'll get left behind. But before I talk about technology, let's look at you know, some of the big macro forces that are actually affecting the insights industry. The first and foremost is you know, consumers are becoming cash rich, but they're becoming time poor. Cash rich is a relative term. You know, somebody who had you know, $10 now probably has got $20, but somebody who's got a million dollar probably has got $2 million. But relatively speaking, people have more cash. But one thing that they all have in limited quantity is time. In that kind of a context, if you actually go and call somebody on a Friday evening and say, hello, I'm calling from so-and-so research agency, and I've got a 45-minute questionnaire for you, would you be willing to take research? How many of you would say yes? And we're all in the research industry. Not even one hand went up. And the other shocking thing is, you know, about five years back, we did a fairly long study in the US, and we paid respondents close to $50 as an incentive. And we managed to finish the study with a bit of push and shove. Repeated the study in Europe recently. We paid an equivalent of 100 euros, which is $130. The study overran by almost three months. So you can pay people money, but they don't have time. That's the reality. So that's one big macro force. The second thing is there is a big battle for share of attention. Everyone, on an average, has got at least two gadgets that they're looking at at any point of time. And Tiffany talked about you know, connectedness and so on. People are extremely connected right now. And that results in people having less time at their disposal. And last thing is people have this right here, right now mindset. And they don't have patience to sit through a long um, interview or a focus group discussion. They just want instant gratification. That's the world in which we are living in. So these are some of the big macro forces. I'm not saying that these are comprehensive uh, set of macro forces that are facing the insights industry. We can go on to talk about you know, talent bankruptcy and so on and so forth. But you know, these are things that are relevant to the subject in question, which is technology and its impact. While this kind of thing is happening to the insights industry, on the other hand, there is a big thing that is happening in the technology space. There are, in my view, four big forces that are disrupting the technology landscape. The first one is shift to portable and mobile devices. In a lot of countries around the world, access to internet is actually happening through a cell phone, more than it is happening through a computer. Particularly if you go to countries like India, China, and the whole of Africa, you find more people accessing internet through their cell phone than through uh, a computer. So this is an irreversible trend. This is certainly an irreversible trend. It was actually a very unreal experience. I was in India about a month ago, and I was in an absolute small rural pocket. And I took out my Blackberry, and there was a 3G connection right there. It was really remote. It was at least 400 kilometers from a nearest small town. And they had 3G connection. And I was really surprised by that. And that's the level to which you know, the technology is moving towards portable and mobile devices. There are 4.8 billion people in this world who own a mobile phone. You heard the statistics. And you also heard that that's more than 4.2 billion toothbrushes that are being owned by people. So it's, it's strange. You know, we talk about people don't have money. They don't want to pay a premium. They don't want to do this. They don't want to do this. And you know, we keep lowering prices of products. But here comes cell phone. I don't know how long toothbrushes have been in business. You know, they must have been in business for probably 150 years now. But in come cell phones, probably a 20-year-old technology. And I don't think there is any cell phone that is available out there which costs less than $50. But people are paying $50, but they are reluctant to pay a dollar for a toothbrush. And there are 600 million of them who don't want to pay for a toothbrush but are very happy to pay for uh, a toothbrush or, or a cell phone. The second thing that is the rise of GPRS and mapping technology. You can run, but you can never hide now. 
almost everyone who carries a cell phone can be tracked down today. There are more and more devices coming with all these embedded technology. And these embedded sensors are going to have a huge impact on the way we do research going forward. But while these three are good positive forces that are having impact on the business, there is one thing that we should be cognizant of, which is the whole battle for data privacy. And that's a negative force. I'm saying negative force because that could impede us. It could slow us down. So that's, those are three positive forces and one negative force that could fundamentally change the way we do business. The reason why all this is happening is because technology is really accelerating. The rate at which it is growing is incredible. So let me just walk you through some of the rapid changes. Remember Gordon Gecko in Wall Street and that famous cell phone? Yeah, and see the cell phone today. Yeah, not, it, just in about 15 years, the cell phone has changed from that to what we have today. Believe it or not, the power that we have in that cell phone on the other side, it's more than the power that NASA had on a computer when they put a man on the moon. Now that's the power we all have. Remember the first Commodore PC with an audio tape interface? And probably a machine that is 10,000 times faster than that is there in a tablet. Leave alone, you know, big mainframe computers or supercomputers. And all this has happened in our lifetime. And it, the, the rate at which it is growing is very, very rapid. Can you raise the volume, please? There's so much content out there. Information overload is really the problem of our day in many ways. There's lots of data out there. Now the trick is how do you get intelligence out of it, not just noise. Most of the data that is available today is unstructured data. It's text, written words, spoken words. And that's really where lots of come. Consider a human who can read essentially an unlimited number of documents and understand those documents and completely retain all the information in those documents. Now imagine that you can ask that person a question. That's essentially what, what this gives you. Awesome represents a way to look at all this data and extract the needle in the haystack, the key insight that's useful. While it's playing the game show Jeopardy as its test case, there are lots of other domains where people want questions answered. Itchy the mouse and Scratchy the cat starred in Skinless in Seattle on a show within this Fox show. Watson, what is The Simpsons? Right. Familiar saints. For 400. Familiarity is said to breed this from the Latin for despise. Watson, what is contempt? Right. Let's finish magical monastery tour. In 1939's cartoon The Pointer, this guy got a new, more pear-shaped body, and pupils were added to his eyes. Watson, who is Mickey? Mickey Mouse, yes. Now we'll ask him. Even a broken one of these on your wall is right twice a day. Watson, what is clock? Clock is correct. And with that, you move up to 23,000. Life is really about questions and answers. But well, Watson cannot help us get some of those answers and make us smarter individually, which will then create a smarter planet. Scary, isn't it? Here is a computer that plays two Jeopardy champions and it beats them. If you really want to watch this in more detail, go to YouTube and watch it. And when I looked at it for the first time, I got a little bit worried. So here is a computer that has got a collective intelligence of a really, really smart human being. It can process logic and it can, it can play with a human being and probably beat human being. Beating a human being on chess is one thing, because chess is a very mathematical kind of game. It's a game which has got a bunch of trees that you have to go through and decision trees, but Jeopardy, it requires incredible amount of language processing skills. And that's what Watson does. Now this is with current technology. That's the extent to which technology has come in this world. You think somebody like IBM is actually sitting there and saying, okay, we got it, now we're not going to do anything more? No. They are currently working on a computer which is going to be probably 1,000 times faster and more capable than the Watson. And it is very much in the works right now. The belief is that when this computer comes up, 
it will probably have collective intelligence of uh, maybe a small town. You know, when I was talking to somebody from IBM, they were saying that, you know, our goal is to produce a computer that has got the collective intelligence of the city of Boston. Now, once you get to a stage where you make a computer that is more intelligent than many smart human beings, the computer's ability to generate something which is even better than itself would be much, much faster. We are certainly at a fairly early stage of the technological revolution. When that happens, imagine the implication of that for research. Imagine the implication of that for how we mine data. It might become a semi-intelligent machine. It might never replace people, but it is going to make human beings that much more powerful. So that is one big impact of technology on our function. It is changing at a very, very accelerated pace, the whole world of technology. Just in the last 10 years, we have seen so many things happen. But while this rapid change in technology is happening around us, look at what we as a group, as researchers, achieved over the last 75 years. What we have achieved over the last 75 years is we have effectively taken a paper and pencil questionnaire and we have put it on the internet. Whereas the world of technology, the interface has changed dramatically. And about three years ago, when I was looking at this, and I was sitting there and saying, oh my god, we, are we getting left behind in this process? I don't feel so despondent today as I felt, let's say, three years ago. In the last few years, I've seen incredible amount of innovations that have taken place. Our ability to come up with innovative ideas is not a big constraint. But one constraint that we have collectively as a function, which probably goes back to the DNA of the function, is a little bit of cynicism. Any technology that comes up, usually, you know, given that most researchers are risk mitigators in their, in their job, they will always find two or three reasons why the technology is not necessarily appropriate for what we are doing today. But if you think a little bit more expansively, I think there is a lot that we can achieve. So, have we as a research industry changed at the same pace at which technology has changed? My submission is that it's a no. We haven't really changed as fa fast as the world of technology has changed. We probably need to you know, tie our laces and get ready for a, a much faster run going forward. The reality is there is a massive data deluge that is coming. There's a really big data deluge coming if it is not already there, and it's going to get worse. Just in this conference, you know, a lot of us heard the word big data at least 500 times during the course of the conference. We can look at big data and say, oh my god, how do I tame this big monster? Or we can look at big data and say, what do I need to do to convert that big data into an opportunity? There is nothing that is going to stop this from happening. It is what we do to tame the big data, that's going to make a big difference. You know, you also heard the term variety, velocity, and volume. All three are going to increase at an accelerated pace. In that world, what are we going to, what are we going to do to really become smarter insights professionals going forward? This is one area which probably insights people did not touch in the past. And I'll, I'll share with you a small story. About a, three months ago, we invited close to 21 big companies who mine big data for their living. Believe it or not, there was not even one mainstream research agency in that. There not even one mainstream research agency in that. I almost see a parallel industry developing there, which might or might not play in sync with the insights industry that we are all familiar with as it stands today. So there is a very distinct possibility that that industry might take off. It might start providing insights in a slightly different fashion especially if the sources of data are going to morph significantly, they might well become the mainstream agencies. So if you are not going to rise to the challenge, we could be in trouble. But it is not that people are sitting there and saying, okay, you know what, I've lost the race and I don't want to do anything about it. I'm really heartened to see you know, a lot of big agencies doing some really good work in the area of uh, leveraging technology. Even for some traditional things like retail measurement, Companies like Nielsen are really leveraging the mobile technology to get insights on where are the new outlets being opened. They are using satellite imagery to map 
outlets by different grids and then to make sure that you know they have representative sample across all the grids very high tech things that they could never do in the past they are leveraging technology to do that they're even doing retail census measurement through crowdsourcing think about going to africa and if you have to enumerate every single outlet in africa that's going to be a nightmare but with the help of cell phone you know they are able to enumerate every single outlet and believe me an outlet in africa is not what we know as an outlet here an outlet in africa is somebody who's got a small desk they put a small cloth and they've got a five item that they sell that's an outlet so how do you enumerate all those outlets because they come and go and this is how they're leveraging technology to do that there are others sorry there are others who are you know going at it from a slightly different angle which is how do i read people's facial expression and understand what they are thinking imagine a world these are not science fiction these are things that are already out there imagine if you walk into a kiosk and you're trying out dresses depending on your facial reaction it starts recommending outfits for you imagine a world when you're doing a skype conversation on a cell phone <coughs> depending on your facial reaction it actually starts bringing up the right kind of emoticons which you can send to people robo with empathy it's not too far off cars that sense drivers attentiveness a lot of these things are uh, either already in place or around the corner facial decoding i want to show you an experiment that we did as a company this what what time what was what over the duration of the ad that was the time of the interview that's all it took to do the interview somebody sits in front of the computer looks at the tv ad and maybe on the way out ask uh, answer one or two questions and that's it think about the speed at which you can actually edit this ad and make it better and usually when you do a typical advertising testing it you know the minimum time that you need is couple of weeks to really do a meaningful advertising testing this one just when the offline edits come out before people are actually doing some final edits you can actually go and do a quick facial recognition exercise go back to people and provide them with some feedback relatively quickly which can make a big difference between not being successful or not successful so that's the way some of the technologies are being leveraged the the world in which you start off a survey in a cell phone and then it directs you to uh, an online study on a computer is not too far off there are people who are already doing it it's going to become more and more popular going forward passive studies you know people leveraging cell phones to do facial coding is really becoming relatively big in some markets but again it is in fairly early stages but sooner than later it's going to take off in a big way going social you know this is a technology that we have leveraged quite a bit you know especially when we sponsor big large music events we want people you know 100000 kids turn up for watching a big concert how do we actually make sure that they get engaged with the music group not just in terms of jumping up and down and screaming but in terms of interacting with <coughs> the song and the event that's a, and and we get incredible amount of insights based on that i don't know how many of you have heard of this technology from a company called bluefin this might fundamentally change the way we've been thinking about media planning go to youtube or any or just to their website and see some of the details that they have and when i first saw it it was actually mind blowing and you know and joe he put his hand up because he's also evaluated this uh, at some point of time 
I'll show you a video that very briefly explains what this technology is all about. <coughs> Super Bowl 46, the highly anticipated rematch between the New England Patriots and the New York Giants, made social TV history. Here you see real tweets about the game and commercials appearing in sync with the telecast. In total, there were 13.4 million social media comments made about the Super Bowl. This chart shows the volume of social media comments throughout the game. Social media talked about all aspects of the Super Bowl, the game, the halftime show, and the commercials. Bluefin's system has data on all of it. Here's a moment from the first quarter, when Victor Cruz scored the game's first touchdown. The tweets highlighted in yellow indicate social media comments made about this play. Bluefin's semantic analysis technology can understand and pick out tweets about specific moments during the game, as well as individual commercials. The tweets shown in blue are comments solely about the commercials. As we know, Super Bowl ads are always a topic of conversation. This year, the commercial alone drove 1.2 million comments in social media. And the social TV winner among all commercials? It's this one, the body wear for h and M spot featuring David Beckham, which aired in the first half. The tweets in blue are comments made about this specific commercial. There are 114,000 social media comments made about this ad, which resulted in 73 million earned impressions. In total, the 91 Super Bowl commercials, covering pre-game and post-game spots, generated a collective 950 million earned impressions. Here are the top three commercials by number of social media comments. H&M, a first-time advertiser in the game, came in first, but was closely followed by Chrysler's Halftime in America ad. M&M's Sexy and I Know It came third with 103,000 social media comments. For more about the Super Bowl's advertising... So with this technology, or to learn about how social TV linking social media with television viewing habits, you can fine-tune where you buy your spot, when you buy your spot, and thereby quantitatively improve your media planning and your return on investment that you've spent on media dollars. I'm not saying that these are the only cutting edge technology. There are lots of interesting technology. I just wanted to give us an idea of some of the things that are happening. A lot of these have taken place in the last three years. So there is really strong hope for us as a group going forward. And I'm sure uh, you know, this will only accelerate going forward. All that it suggests is that ignoring technology is not an option anymore. We have to leverage it. We have to make it a friend as opposed to get intimidated by it. The other area in which technology is going to play a big role is not just in terms of data collection, but it is in terms of delivery of insights. My humble point of view is that visualization is going to be the next frontier. What I'm going to show now is an incredible piece of visualization software, not done by a large company, not done by a geeky nerd in Palo Alto or Bay Area, it is done by an undergrad student in Amsterdam. Yeah? And this code is open. And the guy is saying, you know, you want to use this code, go ahead and use this. Just watch this video on how you can actually visualize how people process stimulus. In this case, the stimulus is a movie. Yeah? You can easily replace the movie with an advertising or with you know, the trailers that Tiffany showed, or whatever you want to do. And you can visualize it and immediately tell you whether the movie is doing well or not, whether at least people are liking it or not. Watch this. Somebody who did it as part of an undergrad project. 
Now, visualization of information, we all know that can make it can make a big difference to our insights getting accepted and embraced versus you know a boring uh, a PowerPoint presentation which is filled with facts. So, what can we look forward to in the years ahead? I picked up, you know, we are all familiar with neuroscience and you know, there was a first day workshop that was being held, Dr. Pradeep talked about neuroscience and you know, what all different companies are doing in the area of neuroscience. But what next? This one, I read about it and I got a little bit scared, but at the same time optimistic about the possibilities for us in this insights function. The same guy, you know, this Dr. Knight, who is also, I think, part of NeuroFocus, uh, they figured out a technology whereby they can check your brain waves and with 70 to 80 percent accuracy can tell exactly what words were there in your mind. With 70 to 80 percent accuracy. That's scary. Right? So, this is light detection on speed. Imagine right now that technology is not going to be available for insights uh, uh, application. The technology is going to be used for people who have speech disabilities. They might have speech disabilities, but they don't have thinking disabilities. But when they think, the words come out of the computer. Now imagine one day, you know, this might be made available for market research too. And when that happens, the need to ask questions would be gone because they will automatically tell you what they are thinking about and today it is 70% accuracy, maybe in another five years time it might be 80-90% accurate which in any case is at least 10 times more accurate than asking people a question and getting an answer. Right? So that's the way some of the technologies are, are headed. So there is a lot of hope for the function, there is a lot of optimism, things are going to change for the better. Now, as I was going through this presentation and I said, okay, you know, let's take a shot at some top 10 predictions. Now, how many of them will come true? Who knows? You know, these are top 10 predictions till 2020. When will they come true? Some of them might be in the near term. Some of them would be by 2020. But for what it's worth, here are my top 10 predictions for 2020. Focus groups will go virtual entirely. Right now, a lot of focus groups happen virtually, but sooner than later, they will become virtual almost entirely. The days of recruiting people, bringing them to a very hostile, you know, uh, one-way mirror environment might be gone. And it might become completely virtual going forward. Number two, asking questions and getting answers might become thing of the past. Yeah. This could be a bit controversial because the whole industry is built around asking questions and getting answers. Is it going to happen in this year? Probably no. But by 2020, I genuinely believe that asking questions and getting answers is going to become less and less important in the world of uh, insights. The third one, in the top five research agencies, I predict that there will be three new entrants. Yeah? Google has already put a toe in the market research industry. But my guess is it's a question of time before somebody like Facebook will start providing insights to their clients, not necessarily insights meant for growing their own business. Believe it or not, there are lots of consultants who have 800,000 insights professionals on their role. Quietly unbeknown to you know, the mainstream agency, these people have been hiring researchers. It's a question of time before they also jump into the bandwagon and say, wow, you know, why am I using somebody else's data? Why can't I generate the data myself? Especially when the big data thing becomes more and more prominent, the consultants will surely see a big opportunity in terms of jumping into the inside industry. So I believe, you know, you know, by 2020, the top five agencies will have at least three new entrants who are not there today. Mobile will be the primary way of collecting data. Whether it is a cell phone or whether it is a tablet, but that, those two will be the primary way of collecting data. And I'm saying on a global basis, it will be the primary way of collecting data, not just you know, in developed countries. In developing countries like India and Africa and China and other places, the, the quality of cell phone coverage and the quality of cell phones that are available 
is incredible. And you know, sooner than later, you'll find everybody walking around with them. I mean, the best story that I can ever tell about this is my mother, who is 80 years old, she started describing what all features she wants in a cell phone. Actually, what she was talking was a touchscreen smartphone. She didn't know that it was a touchscreen smartphone, but at 80 years, she lives in India all by herself, and she's got this beautiful touchscreen uh, smartphone. If she can have one, she's never, you know, she's never seen telephone in her life for a very long time, but now she's got a nice touchscreen smartphone. And that's the rate at which you know, things are getting adopted in uh, developing countries. So mobile is going to be the way of collecting data going forward. Biometrics will become mainstream, whether it is neuroscience or you know, uh, facial coding recognition or body uh, temperature and so on and so forth. Biometrics will surely become uh, mainstream going forward. Television rating points will probably be a thing of the past. People will move from television rating points to what I would call as connection rating points because marketers will be connecting with consumers in many different ways. And understanding the connection rating point is going to become more and more important going forward. And those who build empires by just looking at, you know, television viewing habits and making it finer and finer, you're probably looking, you know, fine tuning something that might become extinct over a period of time. Technology versus privacy battles is going to get bigger and more frequent. You know, it's a question of time before somebody will file a lawsuit against Pinterest saying that a lot of photographs that are there in your website don't have copyrights. You don't have copyrights to them, so you shouldn't be having them. You know, people, European governments going after Google, American government going after uh, Apple for you know, price fixing, so on and so forth. Those kind of battles are going to increase more and more. What is the extent to which government will regulate technology? I don't know, but these battles are things that are actually going to happen. Here is another controversial one, considering that you know, we are all in the inside business. I think random sampling will die. It's a question of time before uh, you know, an epitaph would be written somewhere saying that you know, long ago lived this good thing called random sampling. I think our ability to do random sampling is going to become incredibly difficult going forward. So we might as well ac accept it and figure out what are we going to do in a world where the random sampling is not going to be there. Situational research is going to become the new normal. Considering the fact that embedded sensors are really big and they're going to get bigger and they're going to get more and more sophisticated, doing situational research is going to result in much higher quality information. We do shopper insights work where we ask people questions about, you know, tell me about all the shopping uh, things that you've done, shopping events that you've done over the last one week. And let's talk about the one that you did a week ago when you bought a can of Coke. And I'm sitting there and saying, even I can't answer those questions. Why am I even asking those questions? But if I had asked the same question at the time when the person bought a can of Coke, I would have gotten much, much better information. So the situation research is going to become increasingly important. Digital natives will become the new breed of researchers. And that might have implications for the way we hire. You know, especially with technology going, uh, developing at such an accelerated pace, the digital natives are going to be the the most sought after. And we might have to compete with the likes of Google and Facebook to hire. You know, how many of those really smart, geeky people who go and join Google and Facebook would join a research agency? Not too many, because they don't find the environment very conducive for expressing their creativity. So what are we going to do to attract those caliber of people to really drive the industry forward? I believe the industry is at a big crossroads. Right now, we look at insight as a primary deliverable, but sooner or later, we might be forced to move to a situation where insight becomes a means for driving inspiration and provocation. Insights won't be a primary deliverable anymore, and it's going to happen very soon. And that is a choice that we need to make. And it is not a choice that we can postpone for too long because it is at the next exit. And the next exit is not too far off. So in this world, new world that is likely to emerge, the type of skill sets that we require also are going to change quite significantly. It is the one at the top and the one at the bottom. The one at the top is not going to go away. We still need to be good at you know, precisely measuring and telling people what's happening. But at the same time, we also need to be a lot more comfortable with 
higher levels of ambiguity. And when you have higher levels of ambiguity, ability to tell stories is going to become a lot more important. Statistical significance is really good, but if random sampling is going to die, how are we going to actually even stand up and, you know, with a straight face, talk about statistical significance? So coming up with logical deductions is going to be a, a new skill that is that's going to be required going, going forward. From a conclusive mindset to an exploration mindset, because if you're talking about inspiration and provocation, it is not necessarily always a situation where we go with a set of firm conclusions and say it is this and not this. But it might well be, let's explore. These are all the insights that I can bring to the table. Let's explore about the world of possibilities. And that might require a different kind of mindset and skill set in terms of the way we service our clients or internal or external. From analysis to synthesis, data is going to be made available in user-friendly format more and more aggressively going forward. Analysis is, is likely to become more and more of a commodity. How do we synthesize data across multiple sources and tell a holistic story? That's going to become really important. Technology as an enabler to technology as a driver. And here I would use the word to exclusively. It's not technology as an enabler and technology as a driver. No, it is technology as an enabler to, to technology as a driver. With, you know, you saw Watson and the next iteration of what Watson. God alone knows who else is working on what else. It's going to become a driver. So how do we actually get on top of it and embrace it? And from presentations to visualizations, because that's when stories stick in people's mind. How do we actually visualize our insights in a way in which people look at it and say, I get it and I'll never ever forget it. In today's research world, in conclusion, what I would say is, you know, we are in a world where we have to pick two out of those three. Either we can provide good and fast research that is not cheap, or we can provide good and cheap research that is not fast, or you can do fast and cheap that is not good. That's the reality in which we are in today. But in tomorrow's research world, the expectation would be to deliver all three. Because you remember the world where right here, right now mindset of people Everybody wants everything right now. So this is going to be almost an expectation from everyone saying that do it and do it quickly and do it now. And by the way, I don't have much budget either. So in this rapidly changing landscape of technology, the question that we need to ask ourselves on a daily basis is, are we ready? Do we have the right mindset to do things a little bit differently than we have been doing? Are we willing to push the boundaries on a daily basis? Are we willing to look at acquiring a new set of skills? And more importantly, are we ready to hire people who are very different from us going forward? If we hire people like us, we create a very incestuous kind of community going forward. But if we hire fairly diverse thinkers, diverse set of skills, and yesterday somebody was talking about, yeah, I think the girl from Facebook was talking about all kinds of diverse people in her team. That might be the one that is required going forward. So, technology, are we ready? Thank you. Thank you Stan. I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit more about the visualizations and how that's different from what we're, we're doing currently. Visualization and how that's going to... I showed you that video, you know, that uh, Cinematrics video. That could well be a presentation on your advertising testing. You know, add a few more bells and whistles. That could become a presentation on your advertising testing. And you go through uh, frame by frame, second by second, and say, okay, this screen drove it, and so on and so forth. So the, that's one example of how the visualization could be very different from where it is today. Tomorrow, you might actually end up doing a, a small story, and your whole presentation might be told in the form of a movie that you might create. You know, five years ago, there were no flip cameras. Today, you can produce a fairly high quality movie without, you know, she just demonstrated that. There are people around the world who make movies for her, and she had never even met them. Now, that's the way, you know, we can, we can create stories.
so that's another way of uh, another way of looking at visualization it's not about you know pretty looking powerpoints it's not about you know pressy but it, it's a radically different way of bringing insights to life that's what i mean by visualization thanks for that great presentation so uh, is it fair to say that you pretty much just outline your selection criteria for new suppliers who want to earn Coke's business? No. <laughs> no. No. You, uh, no. Don't put words in my mouth. <laughs> no. That's not, that's not what I meant. And I also showed that you know, there are a lot of some of our mainstream partners who are doing some really good cutting edge work. Three years ago, were they all doing it? No. Uh, three years ago, every single innovation that I was seeing in various conferences were all coming from small boutique companies. Right now, the big ones are also thinking about innovation. Whoever is going to come up with something really breakthrough is going to be a supplier of choice automatically because you're going to, you're going to find that, listen, what they do brings better value to the table. Why wouldn't I use them? Stan, you talked about um, not asking questions anymore. Mm -hmm. and. I wonder if you could speak to that a little bit more specifically, because if unstructured data is taking off and the engineers are producing the answers, how do we ask the questions about that data? How do we ask the questions about it? I think there are two, three different dimensions to not asking questions and getting insights. One is superior observational techniques, unobtrusive observational techniques. That might give you a lot of insights. That's number one. Number two is, you know, all the mining of stuff that people talk about in public domain with an interface, you know, I don't know whether it exists or not, with an interface that, you know, by which you can fire a specific question and against that question it will go out and, you know, come back with some stuff about what people are talking about. So that's another way of getting some insights. The, the third thing is you Create experimentation. The, the, one of the best examples that comes to my mind is uh, there was a vitamin water product that was outside. Uh, that product was actually created by a bunch of people on Facebook. Okay, we had nothing to do with as a company. All that we did was we put an app on Facebook. It was an experiment along with Facebook, done almost two years ago, and people formed a community on their own. And they started creating this product. They created ingredients. They created label. They created what needs to be written on the label. They voted among themselves. It had something like 75,000 people in Vitamin Water fan page. By the time this exercise got over, there were 1.75 million people on Facebook who are fans of Vitamin Water. And it was stuff that they did. All that we were doing was we were sitting on the sideline and watching them create this. They not only did that, they went to the next step. And they went and approached our folks at Vitamin Water and said, do you want us to even launch it for you? Among our own friend circle, do you want us to launch? And a lot of them are shipped a, a crate of Vitamin Water and they had a you know, Facebook Connect variant that was launched. So where was this? We never asked any questions. And an entire suite of research was done in less than six weeks, all the way from a concept to a packaging, label design, form, formulation, the whole nine yards, done. We didn't do product testing though. They said these are the formulation that we want. You know, our own internal sensory experts said, you know, this is an acceptable formula. We said, go. So do we do that every day? No. But that's not asking questions at all. Uh, but in terms of a researcher in, in a large, in this case, a CPG company or a technology company, how is that communicated effectively and that transition um, sold in to, the, to senior management uh, who is, uh, in many cases, accustomed to statistical significance, accustomed to, to seeing traditional research and using that as a sound basis for decisions? Yeah. Usually that is strongly driven by personalities who deliver the message. Okay, so if you are relatively new entrant to the company, you're always on the evaluation block. Because, you know, are you smart is a question that people have in their mind. They might never ask you that question, but they're always checking. But once you have established your credibility, people always assume that you are smart. You don't need to show that you are smart. And I always tell people that there is a fundamental difference between a fact-based presentation and a fact-filled presentation. 
we get confused between the two. We dump a bunch of facts on a chart and circle two or three numbers and show people that, oh, look how smart I am. I can pull out the three nuggets from this morass of information on the chart. That exactly is what we shouldn't be doing. Because that's what confuses people. Because that's what leads them to say, you, can, you circle 35 and the next column is 33. Is this statistically significant? So you're leading people into a conversation where you don't want them to go. But if you tell a story which is fact-based, statistical significance is not something that people bother about. As long as they get a story and they, you know, it actually makes them, it arouses them and they say, okay, I need to take an action. If you can get to that state, who cares about statistical significance? The recipients don't care. We have to do the due diligence. I'm not saying that don't do statistical significance. Do it, do the due diligence, but then go and deliver it in a way in which people should turn on and say, oh, wow, this is awesome. Great. Thank you. Right, let's give it up one more time. Thank you. Yeah.